and questions. And um, and yes, yeah, so they've 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 navigated challenges that raise pertinent questions. And this is where we need your input. Please share to Jamboard your solutions, your ideas. Maybe you've experienced some similar things and you've had ways that, that you've tried, things that you've um, seen that have worked, or maybe things that haven't. It'd be really good to hear from your experiences. And that's one of the things today. It's all about um, us sharing our experiences, but it's not providing shiny, perfect solutions. It's about um, being real about what's worked, what we've tried, and then thinking, what could we try differently? What else might work? So I think that's, that's the... Um, the important the important part of this um, so yeah thank you so much for being with us first of all i just want to um share a quick poll to see um to see where 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 you're coming from with this so so there's three questions there um so if you could just um just just fill those in so which act sector do you primarily identify with i know it's not always that easy to uh, identify that um, but if there is something it'd be good to get a sense of that um, have you used due diligence in your work is that a term you've heard before is it something you've come across um, maybe you're not sure but maybe yes um, and similarly if you did use that due diligence processes as a way of working and approaching things did that create challenges for you was that something that um, that was helpful or, or not you know so just a bit of a sense sense of that and i'll just allow that to run for um another uh, 20 or so seconds and then we will see see the results um, okay 10 more seconds and okay. Okay, so you're probably all aware the meeting is being recorded. Um, so I'm just going to end the polling and then we can um, share the results of that so you can see. So we can see that quite a, a number of us, 48% around from a protection background and then you can see throwing through there um, uh, the, the different backgrounds that people have. Have you used due diligence in your work? So yes, a number of you have 62%, that's quite a high proportion, and then maybe, so maybe that is part of what we're talking about um, as we're working. And did it create challenges? So just over half of you there saying, yes, it did. So um, that, that shows, I think, how pertinent today's uh, conversation is. Um, but thank you for, for joining in with that. And um, great, so now we will hear from Kirsty. Thanks a lot and hi to everyone. Um, I won't take up too much of the time before we get into the, the excellent presentations, but I just wanted to frame uh, our discussions today. So I'm going to make three really uh, brief points. The first one is I wanted to talk about the background to HLP due diligence in humanitarian response. And we'll see from, we've seen from the polls that there's a lot of you from different sectors and that, that's fantastic. So this is going across all of the different sectors. The second point I wanted to highlight really was two operational challenges. There are many more and we will hear in the discussions. Um, and the third one, the third point I wanted to make was just to propose um, some questions for us to consider when we're listening to the presentations so that we can get some real insights into um, their, from their experience and to frame the discussions afterwards. So the first uh, point, the background of due diligence. What is it and why? Well, uh, as many of you uh, on the call, I already saw we're part of this uh, way back in 2013 at least, uh, probably going back further from the shelter sector. Um, there was the global shelter cluster um, pro provided a guidance on land rights and shelter due diligence standard in 2013. And this is recognizing the risk that shelter programming may cause harm and a lot of the problems around that because we operate in really complex environments for housing and land and property rights so obviously we all know that housing uh, that land uh, conflict can be a cause of uh, of the conflict land issues as, as a cause of the conflict and it can also be exacerbated and as a result of the conflict and here we're talking about expropriation of property evictions and secondary occupation so when we're operating in humanitarian response, we're operating in a really unstable environment. We also know, for example, that most of the world's land rights are not registered and most people are not owners. 
So this is a recognition of the difficulties that shelter colleagues were facing uh, and a real um, incentive not to cause harm and to learn lessons. So for example, where we had in the past increased conflict or caused evictions or wasted funding or altogether just undermined the humanitarian response, this was an attempt a uh, really coherent one by the shelter cluster and with, with supporting partners to try to get ahead of that because it is complicated. Um, it's complicated as well because we're working in informal settlements in complex urban environments has been something that has been discussed in the last few years in particular. So the question was how can we provide a humanitarian response across shelter camp management or WASH as well. It's great that we've got some WASH people on the call that takes into account the complexities of housing and land dynamics and doesn't make things worse. And to do that, um, one of the critical um, uh, concepts that Shelter and others are working with is what is secure enough from the point of view of humanitarians, um, as well as for the point of view of people who are, uh, are receiving the shelter or working the shelter and the landowners and the other populations around that. So there's already quite a complicated issue there. Uh, and that, of course, depends on the type of modality. We're looking across the range from the more traditional people returning home uh, after conflict to their homes where they consider themselves to be owners, um, whether or not they, they have documentation, to upgrades of housing um, to provide accommodation for refugees or um, informal settlements and camps that we're working to support. So there's a huge range of modalities and each one of those has their own considerations of what is secure enough. How can we make sure when we're programming that we are understanding the background to the land rights to completing claims um, and not to make things worse, understanding local tenure arrangements and how they might play out through our interventions. And of course, this is different in each context. So one of the most important um, initiatives over the years is recognizing all the work that the operational responses have done to take those guidelines and to adapt them. And I know many of you on the call have been part of adapting those to different contexts. To name just a few of them, there have been in South Sudan, and we'll hear from today, in Iraq, in the Syria cross-border program, and uh, from Bangladesh as well. So each one of those has taken those global standards and tried to really um, understand what that means in the operational context, working together on what is secure enough and how that can um, support programming as opposed to um, uh, make, make sure that it, it's, it, you know, make it too difficult or impossible. Um, just to, to conclude this point is really that this was seen in the revised um, sphere standard this year in the shelter chapter. There is uh, now um, a security of tenure um, standard in the, in the sphere uh, handbook. Uh, and that really, the first point on that is recognizing that due diligence is, is, uh, is one of the critical um, steps in a humanitarian shelter response. And I know, again, many of you on the call were part of revising that um, sphere handbook, and we were all working together for that sphere, uh, for the security of tenure standard. Um, operational challenges, the second point now. Of course, as I said, it's complicated. All of you on the call probably know much better than me what the challenges are facing when you've been trying to implement that standard. Again, what is secure enough is a really fine balance. And I think uh, it would be interesting to hear from our presenters and from the discussants as well. Um, it's not about the legal standard. It's not about legal ownership documents. This is not possible in most of the places we work. Um, so having that as a really high standard is not going to be something that supports the operation. A good reminder of this is when I've been working with the humanitarian mine action colleagues, when we're balancing uh, getting permission to clear land, um, against uh, you know making sure that when, when that's happening you're getting the right permission or you're not creating conflict but at the same time obviously that's a life-saving activity when you're looking at the results of being able to clear that land from mines and unexploded ordnance. so and again this is not about the law or, or necessarily having legal ownership documents but it's about balancing rights and i think haiti for example has got a really good uh, way of looking at that from the perspective of lessons learned <laughs> Uh, in that it's about understanding how to negotiate the rights of the landowners uh, vis via the IDPs uh, and seeing how that can be negotiated. And again, we're hopefully going to hear from the, the, the presenters. This is often not about going in there and expecting some kind of legal certainty, but about being able to communicate well on and balance and negotiate uh, in order to implement programs. 
Um, the second challenge, just very quickly, is how to have a joint response across the sectors. So here, all of these different sectors are approaching due diligence in some way in their programming, shelter, camp management, and WASH. Um, often, some, they, are, they can be different in the different approaches because there are different modalities. And I think from our WASH colleagues' perspective, sometimes these are some of the most um, critical interventions to have due diligence on when they're changing the land use. And perhaps that's something that we need to work more to support in the future. And I'm sure Manasseh will talk about that. Um, the answers are not in the global guidance. It's not about more guidance, but it's really about digging into the operational realities, the discussions, and the problem solving that has already been happening on the ground and trying to really draw lessons learned from that and how to improve. So questions for today to consider um, in the presentations. Again, how has Secure Enough been negotiated in, in each context? How did it work and what problems arose from that due diligence standard? Did it cause too many problems? Uh, and and how, did, how did people deal with that? Um, and linked to that, the second question, what has been the role of the different sector, sectors? What unique uh, value added do they bring to those discussions? Um, for example, it's often due diligence, the home of it can be either with, with shelter colleagues and they have driven the initiatives on operationalizing the standard in many of these contexts, but equally it can be in camp management because they're the ones in some contexts who are having to deal with that first or, or, or the most. And, and so how do we um, provide space for those different um, sectors to hold uh, the due diligence discussions and provide input into that? And since there's so many protection people on the call, I think it's really worth uh, reflecting around the role of the protection sector or protection cluster in these contexts. Often the protection sector uh, or cluster sees itself as, as a standard holder. And in some cases that's really useful. And in others that has been to set an almost impossible standard in some of our due diligence um, operationalization. It's been to set a standard that has been so high that it's not actually possible to achieve that degree of legal certainty in implementing a shelter or a, a camp management response. And so in that case, how has that worked and what is the solution um, to some of those issues and how do we bring those two uh, viewpoints closer together? And if it is in the case in some operations, for example, that it will cause too much harm or it's not possible, to achieve even a minimum standard of due diligence, um, then what has been the response? Has the humanitarian community come together? Have the protection colleagues been able to hold discussions on that um, in a way that is both advocating for change and at the same time um, providing a united front around some of those discussions? Or are the operational actors in the sense of the camp management and, and shelter and wash, having to go in and do those uh, unilateral discussions and make those decisions and take those fights up at individual level, when in fact that would benefit from a united response uh, that brings in the value added of all of the sectors. So I think I'm looking forward to learning from all the operational responses and, and consideration of the people of the call on some of the answers to those so that we can really learn and perhaps uh, prepare better our understanding of how to operationalize the due diligence standard with a much more coherent and realistic response in the future. Thank you very much for your time and I'm looking forward to the presentations. Great, thank you so much, Kirsty. That was really interesting. And I think a couple of things to be really thinking about there as we listen to our colleagues. Um, you know, what is secure enough? How do we think about joint responses across sectors? Who drives due diligence? And what's the role of the protection sector and cluster in these things? How does that work? So thank you, that's really, really great. I'm, I'm really pleased to um, introduce our next presenter. So um, Megan Kirby is going to talk to us about her work in South Sudan. Uh, so yeah, Megan, if you'd like to um, begin, that would be fantastic. Hi everybody, thank you very much. I'm very grateful for the chance to present to you today. And uh, I would like to echo something that Kirsty said. I mean, we, this is uh, a, a case study I'm going to share with you that is about what is secure enough, not only for the IDPs uh, and their, their situation they're in and those who are serving, but also for us as humanitarians and as a humanitarian organization feeling it's the right decision to move forward with an intervention. So this case study I'm sharing with you today is not really a success story. Um, it is uh, definitely filled with challenges, but I think it's important 
that we talk about those challenges and um, we, we share them because that's the means by which we can all learn. So as you can see, uh, as I hope you can see at least, uh, our story is starting out here in Abyei. Uh, Abyei is a contested territory between Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, it's claimed uh, by both countries. It's uh, been the home of a lot of oil production and it has been the site of uh, a lot of conflict over the years. Um, but that conflict now is not between national governments. Um, it is rather between uh, distinct ethnic groups and tribes that have different land use patterns in the same areas. So Jim, perhaps if you can change to the next slide. Anyway, I have another slide here, but uh, to continue, the, the two main groups that are relevant to us, thanks, uh, are the Ngok Dinka and uh, the Misriya. So the Ngok Dinka are a settled uh, agriculturalist group. They're primarily from the south further, um, where the Misriya are uh, pastoralist, uh, semi-nomadic, and they travel with their cattle uh, south through these migration corridors and these pathways that are internationally recognized uh, from Sudan into South Sudan primarily to graze their cows and to bring them to water sources um, found in the southern part of the Abyei box. And as you can see, there's a, a river that flows through the sort of bottom third, and that's the destination for a lot of their, uh, their cattle. So this different usage of land is at the heart of the conflict uh, that, that led to the, the situation I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the Ngok Dinka and the Misriya have engaged in raids and attacks and revenge killings upon one another for, for a long time, but this was really coming to a head at the end of uh, 2019 and the beginning of 2020 this year. And uh, on the 22nd of January, a band of armed Misriya men attacked uh, four Dinka villages, uh, and those villages, as you can see, are, are located in the pop-out box on the right here, uh, Kolom, Nung, Dukra, and Amiet. And in this attack, 33 people were killed, uh, 18 were injured, and 15 children were kidnapped. Uh, so also in this, um, in this attack, 32 houses were burned. And approximately 4,800 people, as a result, fled south to Abyei town and required immediate life-sustaining and, uh, and life-saving support. And I would just like to make a note about the photo here. The photo on the left is indeed from this 22nd of January attack in uh, Colom. However, the photo on the right, it is from Abie, it is also from an intercommunal attack, but it's from a few years before, so just for the sake of, of clarity. Uh, so these, these IDPs had come south to Abie town and were seeking shelter in essentially a burned out school building that didn't have a roof or doors uh, or windows and seeking shelter under the shade of one tree, uh, basically. So although there was a borehole in the vicinity and WFP began providing food almost immediately, this was a very rough place to stay. There were extremely limited uh, resources, limited firewood, essentially no protection from attacks, from uh, the elements, from the weather, even from the sun. So it was, and also size-wise, it was just inadequate for the people who were residing there. So of course, IOM wanted to provide emergency shelter support for these IDPs. And as fate would have it, essentially right across the road from the school building was a parcel of land that had already been graded and demined and compacted and designated for communal use. Uh, and I think Jim, I've got the next on, that, on the next slide. Uh, this land had been cleared and set aside for use as a vegetable market and uh, the community had actually already allowed this land to be set aside uh, and had done a, a due diligence process on securing uh, the rightful owners and the legitimization to use it. Uh, UNISFA, the, the peacekeeping force in Abia wanted to move the existing market, which was right outside of their gate, further north to sort of decongest the area. And this site was designated. And you can see perhaps in the background of this photo, uh, that's, a, that's a, a vegetable market building that IOM actually had already constructed on this site. So we had already been engaged with this land uh, for a different purpose, but it was essentially ready to go. And so seemed to be the perfect solution 
um, for these IDPs. So we immediately began to seek clearance to construct emergency shelters for the IDPs here on this site. And as such, beginning to progress through our own due diligence process, we contacted and uh, consulted the responsible uh, power brokers and parties in the area. And in this case, seeing as the land was held and owned by uh, the government, uh, those parties were the RRC, which is the Relief and Re Rehabilitation Commission, and the local office of the Ministry of Land, Housing, and Urban Development. And it is a bit of a slight complication in this area that this is in a contested territory and the relevant local authorities and relevant law even are a bit fuzzy with um, Sudan's claim on the land as well. But South Sudanese authorities are generally recognized and, um, and South Sudanese law is adhered to. So we sought approval from those two entities to move forwards with uh, building shelters on this land. However, quite uh, dishearteningly, both of these organizations initially refused to take responsibility uh, for this process or for to allow this process to move forwards, uh, claiming that the responsibility rested with each other. The RRC, who is responsible for um, humanitarian issues and displacement of uh, people, displacement of IDPs, uh, they claimed that this was a land issue purely and had nothing to do with them. Uh, the Ministry of Land, Housing and Urban Development uh, made the opposite suggestions, saying this isn't really about the land itself. This is about assistance to IDPs and humanitarian need. And so therefore, RRC has to be the one to sign off on this. We can't take responsibility for it. So to sort of clear this fog of confusion about responsibility, uh, we as IOM drafted a, a basic contract uh, to be modified and to be reviewed and agreed upon by whichever government authority would choose to be signatory and the leaders of the IDP communities. Um, and this contract codified very basic rights, uh, the responsibilities, the limitations uh, regarding the use of this land and this site. And it also secured uh, a temporary amount of time. I had initially written two years in the contract knowing we wouldn't get it, hoping we would get a year of security of tenure and protection from eviction for the IDPs. Um, however, this process didn't move along by um, the development of, uh, you know, documentation and facilitation of discussions and negotiation on our end. And while this is going on, of course, uh, quite frustratingly, the IDPs continued to live in very rough conditions right across the street which is, I can't even say how frustrating this is. You know, uh, we had our shelter materials at the ready. We had the site prepped and ready to go. Uh, we have progressed through our due diligence at this point and ensured that the relevant power brokers had been consulted and that there were no outstanding claims to the land, um, but yet solution did not, uh, did not come. So after numerous failed meetings and uh, a lack of resolution, we decided that it was incumbent upon us essentially to threaten to pull out from providing support at all. Uh, and of course, we were very hesitant to do so. We had no desire to, um, to retract this support, but we needed this minimum guarantee uh, that our investment in time and materials uh, to say nothing of the protection concerns and the protection guarantees of the IDPs uh, would be there. And we realized that we can't engage in work that would potentially cause further harm or further displacement to the uh, individuals on the site and potentially cause reputational or operational problems for us going forwards. So happily to conclude, um, and we can move to the next slide, after about three weeks of delay and many heated meetings, uh, the RRC did concede to sign off on a maximum of six months of tenure for the IDPs on the site, which is less than we hoped for, but enough to proceed with. And the construction of uh, 109 family shelters uh, proceeded, that's about 650 to 700 individuals who were housed. Uh, and we constructed single room shelters also just as a side note, because of the pandemic starting and concerns about health and overcrowding. But in so doing, we also were able to assist 
fewer people uh, as the material and size uh, requirements for individual shelters are greater. So the site uh, is functional and, and operational and continues to house people to this day, but the problem remains and this problematic situation remains. It's not, it's clear that the IDPs are not very welcome to stay on the site and uh, it's also clear that they cannot really return to their village in peace knowing that they are amidst the migration corridors of the Misriya uh, and there, that tension remains. So it's, I'm leaving this off without a great uh, conclusion because there isn't one, but this raised a number of big questions for me and I think some of these are very similar to what Kirsty mentioned earlier. The biggest question I hope we can have a chance to discuss is how do we know as practitioners when the right thing to do is nothing? Because we advocate for that within our due diligence guidelines as, uh, as a viable uh, option. You know, we don't want to do any harm. We don't want to um, step in where we're not certain about the, the um, unscrupulous decision making or potentially questionable motivations of partners we're working with, but it, it's an awful decision to make. So are there red lines on making this choice? When do you compromise your, your principles or potentially jeopardize your future ability to aid people, to aid people in the moment? Um, I know there are no hard answers to these questions, but that's what came to mind as we progress through this. So I will leave it there and I'm, I'm very grateful for your time and your interest and your attention and I look forward to the uh, discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Megan. That was uh, really insightful and a really key question raised there. How do we know when the right thing is to do nothing? How do we know how to action that idea of do no harm? Um, I think that's a key question that I know a number of people have been asking recently. So, um, and that reminds me to remind you that we want to hear from you. So please use the jam boards, use the, the chat to um, maybe you've had experience where you've had to make that choice maybe you've faced a similar challenge so we'd love to hear that up on the jam boards if, if you can if you can do that um and um yes and we'll we'll um, post the links again to the jam boards in the chat so you can follow those that would be fantastic great thank you so now we're going to uh move to um bangladesh to uh Deepika, who's going to speak to us about the rohingya refugee response so Deepika, open over to you Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present on the Rohingya response in Bangladesh. Um, so the due diligence work that we have started, we've just only started in April of this year. So obviously it's not much of a success story in itself because we're still you know, trying to operationalize and implement it, but it just gives a good background of what sort of things we've involved in it and also how we really try to make it as practical as possible like what Christy mentioned, not to, as much as possible, not to get it stuck on just the legal framework, but uh, move it a bit beyond that. Um, so yeah, that's great. Um, Jim, if you can just um, move to the next two slides, please. So this is just a, a picture of the, uh, of the camps itself. So a lot of you are probably familiar uh, about the Rohingya refugee response. If not, um, it's, it's in Bangladesh, in the southern part of Asia, between India and Myanmar. Um, and then the response itself is uh, with 850,000 uh, Rohingya refugees. So it's one of the largest uh, refugee camp settlements in the, in the world. Um, so the, the, the refugees are, are residing in 34 highly congested camps in two sub-districts in the southern coast of um, uh, Bangladesh itself. And it borders uh, Myanmar and then the international border is the Naf River through which uh, the, the Rohingya community um, f uh, fleeing violence from Rakhine State in Myanmar fleed over the river and then got, uh, started settling in the, in, in the two sub-districts of uh, Cox's Bazar. So just an overview of the land itself, um, it's located on 6,200 acres or 2,500 hectares of land. One of the big problems we have here is that majority or 77% of the camp is actually on forest land. 
and also we it's near a, a wildlife sanctuary and a, and a national park and one of the other big problem is that it's also in the corridor of um, uh, endangered um, elephant uh, that goes from um, Bangladesh to Myanmar, a migratory route as well. So that's also another problem. And the remaining um, camp land is located on Kas, which is state land, but also private land. So a lot of the camp is uh, majority is on forest land and the remaining is very much intertwined with uh, host communities that live living among the refugee sh um, shelters itself as well. So there is a lot of uh, issues around use and control of land uh, itself over there. And that's just some pictures of um, the Rohingya refugees fleeing. The first picture is in uh, Myanmar itself, Rakhine State, and the second one is them crossing over the North River coming into um, Bangladesh. Um, next, Jim. Um, so the next one is just a quick timeline. So there has been series of influx of the Rohingya refugees. I mean, they started from 1978 and then there was a second and third influx. So at the beginning, when they arrived in Bangladesh, they settled in two sites called Kutuplong and Napara. So these were the officially registered camps. So they had a legal status at that time. And then we had the, the other influx and the largest influx was in August, 2017. And then they started settling near the two uh, registered camp because they knew them, they were families. So that those two camps started expanding and expanding. Um, and then so it, and then uh, the one in Kutupolong merged to form what is we call the mega camp. And then the other one further down, um, they started, um, uh, you know, occupying a lot more forest land and also negotiating with the host communities. Um, and then it's also started expanding. So it's in two, it's sort of separated into two sub districts in Ukia and Teknaf. Um, so, so there's a bit of a distance between each other. But what happened following that is that there was a lot of protests by the forestry department and other government. Uh, they were very concerned about the degradation and destruction of forest land, about land encroachment, because at that time it wasn't officially uh, declared. So then the prime minister's office retroactively um, declared approved 8,000 acres of land as officially uh, for refugee settlement. And they said, that was also the the administrative boundary and then they said you know uh, we're not allowed to have any um any more occupation beyond that land so there is that restriction for us as well whatever we do we have to it has to be within that uh that, that uh, administrative boundary um and the problem we have over here is that this uh, uh declaration uh was not officially gazetted uh, which means that um so it, it's a bit of a big, uh, you know, legal area because the first department are st still legal custodians, but it's the Triple RC, uh, the uh, the government committee who actually has jurisdiction over this land. So there's ongoing conflict between the two. So at the moment, the forest department has turned a blind eye to it, but there's just ongoing, you know, disputes over that. So that's just within the camp itself. So in 2020. Um, and then following that onwards, uh, you know, then the camp started being settled, you know, um, uh, we had, you know, shelters, infrastructures, facilities, distribution centers, um, you know, child-friendly uh, child centers, all sorts of things were established. And in 2020, we finally established the Housing, Land and Property Technical Forum, which is uh, a technical uh, platform between shelter, uh, um, protection, and also site management and site development, which is CCCM. Um, and then this was established officially at the beginning of this year. And following that in April, 2020, uh, we decided, and then uh, the HLP due diligence guideline, which I'm presenting on today, which was very much focused on the, the COVID-19 related health programming. It was drafted and endorsed, and then we started to try and operationalize it as well. So the, 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 why was there a need for this? Obviously, because of COVID, we're very worried because it's the largest refugee camp. We were worried about what would be the mortality rate, you know, social distancing issues. So we thought it could be 2,500 to 4,500 mortality rate. And then there was also planned construction for treatment, isolation, quarantine centers. You know, we were, you know, there were plans for 850, 900 beds. So at that time, uh, we in the HLP Technical Forum were very concerned about 
you know, how is this going to go ahead? I mean, how are they going to look for land and are they going to be negotiating properly? Bearing in mind that this is like a three, it's just a three year operation. So we thought that we would really want to support the humanitarian community on how they're going to negotiate to rent the land and properties and, and then around construction as well, because this is a new thing for us here. So we also want to make like a procedural checklist. So, um, and then at the moment, you know, do no harm principle. So, so far we have 12 treatment and isolation center and we have many more quarantine centers, both inside and outside the camp. And luckily for us, um, the infection rate has been quite, you know, not as scary as we thought. Uh, you know, the confirmed case is about 250 and the death is about 800. But obviously, you know, they are un underreported and stuff, but it's not as bad as we thought. So, uh, you know, it gave us some more space for us to work on this. Next, Jim. So I'm not going to go through this. I mean, all of you will know the objective of this is obviously to make sure, you know, all the humanitarian agencies who are working in this response do no harm, obviously. And then the three one is basically some level of legal certainty, but also looking at secure enough. Uh, like uh, uh, Kirsty and Megan talked about. And then the problem we have is that there is a lot of tension between the host community and the refugees, uh, you know, on the control and use of the land, not just land, but water resources as well. Um, so we just want to make sure like further on as we start making uh, more facilities and infrastructures that we don't exacerbate the already existing disputes and tensions, but also environmental destruction, because a biggest issue for us is, is the largest camp and constantly, you know, we are, you know, for anything from shelter, you know, bamboo and all the materials we're using, all the construction that we're doing, it doesn't cause a more environmental destruction and degradation. That's why you'll see in one part of this is that we really looked at environmental clearance, uh, making sure that we follow the national legal framework around that. And the third, obviously, you know, uh, not just the refugees, but the host communities are not harmed because we, we now have to increasingly negotiate for land outside the camp areas. So, you know, making sure, and a lot of the host communities in, in this area are agricultural dependent. So we don't wanna be constructing large warehouses and distribution centers on arable agricultural land, you know, it's about food security issues, but also that it doesn't lead to forced eviction because they know they're going to get a lot more money from um, agencies who are willing to pay for them and then they lose a lot source of livelihood as well. Jim, next. So with the due diligence, we, we, uh, we also referred a lot uh, guidance note that Christy talked about before, and then we adapted it. So we, we decided on uh, nine minimum steps. And, and this uh, drafting process, we went through the forum itself, the HLP forum, Christian Shelter and the site management. So there was a lot of iterations as well. Um, so we came up with nine minimum steps, but because there was such an urgency for the establishment, we had to say, okay, you, if you can't finish all the nine steps, you can do one to the fourth steps and then you can do the rest later on because that just requires a bit more. And sometimes the other, uh, the other steps, uh, four steps might not be necessary depending on the type of, um, you know, construction work or what you're using the land for. So obviously the first, I'll just quickly go through this. Just the first step is just because we're starting from scratch. So we had to make sure that the agencies, um, and this one was mainly targeted towards the health sector because they were the one who was leading in the establishment of isolation, quarantine treatment. And and, and then I think this is also later on a bit of a challenge as well, because for us uh, in HLP, particularly uh, protection, shelter, and CCC, I'm a lot more familiar, but with the health sector, it can be a different language. So it, it, it's, it's a bit difficult. Um, so the first step obviously is to actually have a clarity on why they require the land or property, like the purpose. Um, it could be that they just, they need, just need to rent just the land only because maybe they needed to park ambulances or they needed to, you know, have uh, to stock their uh, medical supplies and that's just it. But it could be that they need, um, that they need uh, a land and to construct new construction sites or they could just have a, a property that they're just going to rent. Uh, you know, and retrofit. So just, just have an understanding of what and what is the size that they require. In terms of quality, do they need to make sure that the soil, there's proper drainage facility? You know, is there like a, a water, you know, water table, proper aquifer system in there that they need? 
Um, in terms of location ac accessibility, particularly for the health agencies, um, accessible roads so the ambulances can fit in. Is there like 3G, 4G mobile network services in case, you know, health emergency, they need to bring other people. So those sort of things, we put them in. And also clarity on the duration. Um, is it just a temporary thing that we set up during COVID or is it that we're going to establish a proper treatment facility that you hand it over to the to the um, health department that they can use later on? So is it for one or two years? So uh, depending on that also, you know, how would you negotiate for the type of um, arrangement you would have over that? Step two, then after we have a clarity in-house, step two, then initial assessment of the land. Obviously, you know, that would involve doing a transect walk around, checking the boundaries of the boundary markers. You know, it could be that they have walls. It could be that it's just, uh, you know, uh, trees or, you know, a post or wiring. Um, obviously, we want to check GPS coordinates, and this is useful for later on when we check the suitability of land. And land use as well, is the current land empty? Are there actually people living there who, you know, crops are there and they've just harvested it. So, you know, that's also important. Are you actually using um, um, land that they're using for agricultural purposes? And that's something we have to be very careful about, too, because in the national rural development policy, they've actively said they don't want agricultural land to be used as settlement because of food security issues, you know, and, and those sort of issues as well, livelihood issues. And then at this to the point where they check whether the land meets the requirement in step one and then also talk to the neighbors at that point just to check uh, the landowner are they actually confirming that, that they are the land land owners um, is the whatever we're going to construct is it going to impede the access to other resources if you're going to construct something over there uh, you know do they need a pathway so then step three is about suitability of land obviously based on the gps coordinates then we would map the land parcels. We also do hazard mapping. Bangladesh is very, you know, it's natural. It's very known for natural disasters, like high flood, landslide, high tide zones, you know, cyclones every during the season. So it's also important to make sure the land that we identifying are not actively in this area to avoid those areas. And the other one is obviously um, topographical consideration, just making sure that the slope is less than 10 percentage uh, mainly because this is going to take a lot of investment to uh, grade the land or compacting it. It, it, it needs a lot of uh, investment to make it habitable again. And then, the, and then for the step three also, for each of this, we actually included uh, a, a list of uh, contact details of who they would uh, co who they can contact from the government and also from within the response, the site management, site development sectors, uh, and then the particular site management teams in either IOM or UNHCR, IOM, because the camps are divided into area of responsibility between IOM and UNHCR. So there are contact points who work around this, who can support agencies with the you know, um, GIS and other mapping purposes as well. So step four is, this is the part that's, uh, that we were still very, very unsure of, collection and verification of tenure and land documentation. And for this, I'll go into Depeka. detail here. Yeah. Depeka, Sorry? I'm just yeah. uh, mindful of the time. So I wonder yep. if you could just move to some of maybe the key challenges that you would like oh, us no. to really yeah. think about. No is that this slide yeah. or would you like me to move no, to I'll another just, slide? I'll just quickly go, yeah. So I'll just quickly go through this. And okay. then it's the next slide. So just quickly with this one, it's, it was more like we didn't want them just for documentation. So we also took verification or testimonies from the lowest level of the government, the union parishad, so that even if they don't have tenure documentation, the union parishad will, will be able to say, yes, we know the chain of ownership from the father. Sorry, it's, it's always father or grandfather here. It's quite gender specific. So, you know, they could trace the, the ownership. The problem we have is that a lot of the land is actually occupied forest land or occupied um, other, you know, so it's, it's quite difficult to understand that as well. So that was a bit of a challenge for this and also trying to contact the landowner properly because they might be absent as well. Jim, next. Next. So then we also have the other steps, which we didn't take because it wasn't that necessary at that time. So we didn't go. So I'll just quickly go through it. What was, it was like, one of the thing was we need to get a no objection certificate from the forestry department. 
because they wanted to make sure whatever land we use, it's not a protected area or a foresty area. We also had environmental clearance, depending on the type of construction work, is it gonna have like emission or is it gonna use a lot of water or medical waste that they would have to go through this? So we provided the, uh, the documentation for that, but most of the time it wouldn't involve that much. And then also about um, land use development planning, if it, if, it, if it involved demolition or construction of large building, it would have to meet the criteria for uh, urban development or land use development criteria. And the other one was about agreement, making sure that you know the agreements uh, had basic uh, provisions, but also that a lot of them don't understand. So we also do digital recording because they might not have uh, formal education. So the challenges that we I wanted to share about is basically uh, Bangladesh is very it's a refugee setting. So obviously we're very limited with what we can do within the legal framework. Um, it's it's a very newly developed it's it, independence 1971. So it's, it, there is an undeveloped land administration and land management. Obviously, you know, land records are not digitized. Uh, and then the, the camp land is not gazetted. So there's that gray area. So there's always this ongoing conflict, whether this is actually forest land or cast land, or, you know, is it actually really private land? So, and there's also conflict of interest over what to use and what not to use. So the camps inside the air land inside the camp, you can get permission from the triple RC or the camp in charge. For the outside, you have to go through many layers of the government itself. So and there's also difficulty in locating landowners itself as well. But one of the challenges we had was that this one was mainly around the health response. So it was very difficult for certain different sectors to uh, to operationalize it because, you know. It, there was, we had to really work around understanding, which is still a challenge for me because I don't think we've done a good job around that. Also, the issue around urgency and the procedural requirement. You know, we, th there was a need to have all these treatment centers established and then just, it wasn't that we wanted to put all of these barriers, but it was just to make them understand that there's certain things that need to happen as well. But also identifying the persons in charge in the agencies. It was not so much like the protection shelter or CCCM, it was more like the procurement and logistics department who were dealing with this. So it was also very difficult to then really try and sit with them to go through this process itself. So one of the thing would be to really involve it from the very beginning, particularly CCCM uh, site management, because it's about land within the camp itself, even though it's congested. But then how do we take it forward? Because we are the ones who are most vested in the HLP due diligence work itself. So thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Topeka. That was um, fascinating. And I think um, really we get a feel of the complexity and the multiple degrees of ownership and land use and all those conflicting things. And a really interesting point you make there at the end that, OK, it's one thing to think about the different sectors and clusters that might need to work together. But then we've also got others that are working in procurement in other areas and the health, thinking about how this integrates with health as well. I think these are really relevant and big questions. So thank you so much for that. Really appreciate that. Um, just before we move to the next speaker, uh, a number of you I've noticed uh, are asking about uh, the presentations and wanting to see the slides. So I will tell you that um, whilst the session is being recorded, there will also be a report and I will check with the speakers about sharing um, content of their slides uh, with you as well. So we will look to do that if that's at all possible. And just want to emphasize again, please do, if you have examples, responses to some of these questions that are coming up from our presenters, please do, um, go on the Jamboards, post your uh, experiences, your ideas, because we really want to hear from you. So please do. Um, and um, OK, so we're going to move now on. So um, I really appreciate all the input there from um, our presenters. Um, and again, that issue of, you know, when is it right to actually think about do no harm and potentially not acting um, it comes up again and again. How do we navigate the complexity between um, different types of land ownership? Um, how we see um, some challenges in terms of how maybe land ownership hasn't been registered and how that happens. And, and yeah, I think very real, real challenges there. So thank you. So um, without further ado, I'm pleased to um, move to our um, more discussion section. So again, please use the chat, use the Jamboards to um, 
uh, to share your, your thoughts. Um, I think each of our presenters have raised questions there that they would um, like assistance with. So um, uh, around the things that we maybe have got experience of ourselves or maybe that we, we've heard of, of, of examples. And we're going to turn to our, um, our panel who have, have agreed to be discussants. So um, I, I'm going to ask each of them to um, respond to what they've heard. It might be that there's a particular question that came up that they've, they feel that they've got an answer to. It might be that they want to speak to that need for coordination across the different sectors. Um, it might be something else that, that's, that's sort of come to mind. So I'll do a round with each of our, our discussants. So we have Ella Sedaroglu from the Global Shelter Cluster co-lead. We have Juan Sofana Panic, who's the Global CCCM coordinator, Ibere Lopez, the HLP advisor for the Global Shelter Cluster, and Kirsty Farmer, the HLP consultant who we heard from at the beginning. So um, I'm going to um, just sort of go through each of those and if you'd like to um, to respond then and then we'll open up some questions that we've had come in already that we'll then put to um, yourselves and to the presenters and see see where we go. Um, so um, Ella would you would you like to um, to begin? Yes sure shall I uh, turn on the video or maybe is that too much for people's bandwidth? Well, I'll turn off my video and then if you can turn on your video. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's see how that works. Um, well, uh, thank you very much um, for allowing um, um, the shelter class 